Hey, deserving listeners, today I'm going to be talking about something that is political. I, I, mean, I don't usually like to talk about political things or politicized things, but I feel the need to do so because a lot of you have been emailing me about this topic. And I'm going to try to make it listenable to both Democrats and Republicans, to both liberals and conservatives and everyone in between, because I believe that certain topics transcend politics and partisan politics. As some of you know, a politician in Florida called another, a male politician in Florida called another politician an effing B. So I'm not going to be using the actual term because I know some of you listen to this podcast with your kids. And so I'm just going to say effing B, and you know what that means, right? And so this was a, a big event, I don't know, about a month ago or something, and a big part of the news has already passed. But I do, I do want to talk about it because I think that this is a much bigger issue. And just to give you some details about this, uh, I think it's a congressperson, Ted Yoho, Florida congress, congressman, called AOC, AOC an effing B in public. And the next day or soon after, Ted Yoho apologized, uh, and I'm going to read his apology. I rise today to apologize to the abrupt manner of the conversation I had with my colleague from New York. It is true that we disagree on policies and visions for America, but that does not mean we should be disrespectful. Having been married for 45 years with two daughters, I'm very cognizant of my language. The offensive name-calling words attributed to me by the press were never spoken to my, co to my colleagues, and if they were construed in that way, I apologize for their misunderstanding. Uh, I won't go into the rest of his apology, but he basically talks about how he comes from a background of poverty, and he often likes to fight for poverty. And then he concludes, I cannot apologize for my passion or for loving my God, my family, or my country. So I just want to summarize this politician's apology right now. He, in public, called AOC, AOC I'm calling her AOC because everyone calls, calls her AOC, but her full name is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And this uh, male called this female politician a effing B. And he apologized by saying, I rise today to apologize to the abrupt manner of the conversation I had with my colleague from New York. It is true that we disagree on policies and visions for America, but that does not mean we should be disrespectful. So he's not saying that I should be disrespectful. He's saying uh, that doesn't mean that we should be disrespectful. I don't know how that is taking responsibility. Then he talks about how he's married and that he has two daughters and that he's very cognizant of his language. Um, and this sort of apology always drives me crazy because people will say, it's essentially saying I can't be racist because I have black friends. This is, or I work with black people or, or my daughter is married to a black person. These kinds of examples are ridiculous. Uh, you can demonstrate that you're not sexist by apologizing for a sexist remark. Now, you don't have to quit. You don't have to resign, but you could just say, you know what? I lost my cool and I said a sexist term, which uh, should not have been said, and I was wrong. Um, I disagree with Ocasio-Cortez, but that doesn't mean I should call her a name. That wouldn't be that hard to say, right? Um, there's, a, there's nothing wrong with a politician, Ted Yoho, standing up for his belief system. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. There is something wrong with calling people names. We're not in the third grade anymore, right? Anyway, uh, and then at the end he says, I cannot apologize for my passion or for loving my God, my family, and my country. So I just really want to drill down on this statement. He called someone an effing bee, and then he gets up to quote unquote apologize and he concludes with, I cannot apologize for my passion, for loving my God, my family, and my country. What in the world does that have to do with calling someone a nasty name? So uh, Ocasio Cortez gave an amazing response speech, which is epic. It's one for the ages. Google it. I cannot do it justice. Uh, you really just have to hear uh, the whole speech. It's not that long, but Google it. So the thing I'll, I'll say here is that We've all been a target of hate. We've all been called nasty names. Uh, we've all been a target of uh, abuse or of um, just bullying or something. You know, we've all been a target. But there's a difference between different kinds of bullying, different kinds of language, and it's based on frequency and intensity. Because a lot of people will say, like, well, you know, Ted Yoho is probably currently on Twitter being called all sorts of terrible 
racist names, sexist names, terrible names. So, you know, that it just happens. Uh, Ted Yoho gets called nasty names and Ted Yoho calls other people nasty names. You know, what's the difference? You know, he's just, he's passionate and he loves his God and his family and his country. And so, you know, that's why he's saying these names. But uh, this, there's a big difference between things that come from privilege and things that don't. And let me, let me explain here. So I'll just use myself for an example. When someone calls me an ugly American, it doesn't hurt my feelings. When someone calls me a gringo in all the Latin American countries, I, you know, I get called a gringo, even though I'm only half gringo, if you will. But sometimes they'll just associate anyone from the United States as gringo. But anyway, the point is, is that doesn't hurt my feelings. Uh, why is that? Well, let me let me go into some other examples. Um, I was in a frat fraternity in college, and sometimes people will not call me, but they'll say, oh, look at those frat guys over there. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I mean, it kind of does, but not really. Or if someone calls me a douchebag or an a-hole or something, these are hurtful words that are usually attributed to men. And they don't really hurt my feelings. I mean, context, I suppose they might kind of hurt my feelings. But let me tell you words that really do hurt me. Words like, and if, by the way, I'm going to rattle off some pretty hurtful words towards Asian Americans. And so just be, you know, cognizant of that. I mean, I'm going to skip forward a couple minutes or if you're listening with your kids. Words like gook or chink or Chinaman. I've been called all these. Dirty Jap zipperhead, nip, oriental, and so on. I just want to repeat these. I've been called all of these. Gook, chink, Chinaman, dirty Jap, zipperhead, nip. These kinds of words are categorically slurs about my identity. Same way that ugly American or gringo or frat guy or something. You know, what or why, what's the difference there? Some might ask. And this is, I think, the difference that isn't talked about enough. And this is why people who want to stay in power will rail on what we call political correctness. Because it, 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 when you just sort of focus on the words without understanding the broader context and you don't explain it to people of privilege that it is the broader context, then people just can excuse it away. Like, well, they're just overly sensitive. They're snowflakes. Well, let me tell you what gook, chink, Chinaman, dirty Jap, zipperhead, and nip mean to me. Those words represent centuries, at least 150 years of oppression in, in, in the United States um, on my people. I have, my people have lived in this country for over 100, my Japanese people have lived in Washington state for over 120 years. So you better believe my people, including me, have experienced uh, massive racism, including the government locking up my relatives during World War II, putting them in prisons. And you better believe that my relatives were called dirty Japs. You better believe that. My father, he was born during World War II. You, you better believe he, he was called a dirty Jap. And those words carry with it 120 years of oppression and literal murder, locking up my, my, my great-grandparents who were in their 70s or something, just totally sweet people. Everyone on my Japanese side of the family, are, they're very, very sweet, nice, law-abiding, polite people, church-going I have people on, on my Japanese side of the family that, that uh, founded churches in Spokane, Washington. Just to give you an idea of you know, their community uh, participation, they were locked up without trial, without representation, without really hardly anyone speaking out against it. White, white people, white neighbors, a few of them cared, but most people, they didn't even notice. It's like, yeah, you know, lock up, lock up those chinks, those dirty Japs. So when I hear, to, when someone calls me a chink or a gook or a Chinaman, the first thing I think is you're just wrong because if you really want to call me a name, it's dirty Jap or zipperhead or nip. That's what applies to Japanese people. But anyway, that's what I hear. That's what I think of. 
the the echoes of almost 50 years of me being me being bullied for not looking entirely white particularly when i was young 120 years of being mistreated by governments and societies and people and particularly white people particularly white men although i will say the last person that called me a chink was a white woman or what looked to be a white woman so there's a huge difference for me being called a gringo which doesn't represent any oppression for me. In fact, being called a gringo, I, I almost have some, you know, because I'm half white, I almost have some like white guilt, some like colonialism guilt when I, I feel like I deserve to be called gringo. What the American society and, the, and white people have done to Latin America, I feel like if anything, yeah, I deserve to be called gring, gringo. But when I'm called a chink or a dirty Jap or a zipper head, it triggers all of the trauma that I've lived through and all of the injustices my people have endured at the hands of those in power. So let's get back to effing B. And I'm avoiding, you know, saying the full word because, you know, it's just, I don't know. I just don't want to say it. <laughs> I, I guess I can say the other words because they're closer to me or something anyway. So let's get back to calling someone an effing B. This represents generations of oppression, sexism, being treated like property, not being listened to. Every time a white male heterosexual in power calls a woman, particularly a woman of color, an effing bee, it resonates all just a lifetime of being the target of sexism, uh, but also generations going back as far as we could probably remember. <laughs> it represents being shut up, being told to shut up, being treated like trash being denied basic human rights, being harassed in the workplace and everywhere, being ignored by the law and by other systems of power for that matter, being ignored by the medical profession for, for many years, being abused by, by people who believe that women deserve to be abused, and when victimized, being blamed. Ah, oh, you must have asked for it. You know, dressed like that, you were asked. Being called an effing bee represents all of that for many women. Now, I'm not going to say all women, but for AOC in her speech that she gave, she talked about that. I'm expanding on it based on my experience. And that's why the, the reason, so all of that is being represented. That's not just like a mistake. When perpetrators of sexism use that word, they know that. They know that there are certain words. Nasty is another word. Net calling a woman nasty is essentially calling upon a whole generation of generations, you know, centuries of power of oppression. There is so much behind that word. Calling a man nasty, oh, that guy's nasty. In our society is different than calling a woman of power nasty. It's telling her to shut up, go back to the kitchen. Or if you're a person of color, go back to the slums where we can ignore you. Let us people of power rule everything and everyone. You know, by using this phrase with you in public and having everyone support me and the fact that I can still keep my job, you will know your place in this world, woman. You will know that I can use this word and call upon centuries of oppression, centuries of abuse. You know that I can call upon that and tell you to watch out because I'm going to get you and you have no place in this world. Perpetrators of sexism, racism, they know that it cuts to the core. When, when that woman, that white woman called me a chink, she knew that that would cut me to the core. She didn't call me a gringo. She didn't call me an a-hole. She used the word that she knew because she was, I don't know what was wrong with her. Uh, it was a, like a road rage incident that made no sense. I mean, she could have been mentally ill. I don't know. But she, she knew that that word would hurt me the most. And you will see that. Perpetrators know. And that's why Yoho used the phrase effing B. He wants this young woman of color to shut up. He used those words as, as, a, as a bludgeoning device. And he hoped 
that she would lose her composure, that she would give up, that she would feel the weight, that she would see that no one would give him a consequence, that all of his colleagues would stand behind him. He knew that that would happen, and it did. And he hoped that that would shut her up because she would realize that she was not in her home turf, that she, she needed to go back to the kitchen, she needed to go back to the slums. But that's not, that's not what she did. I'm just going to read a very little bit of her speech, but just understand that you have to hear her speak it for it to have the power. But uh, these are some excerpts. I walked back out there, and there were reporters in front of the Capitol. And in front of reporters, Representative Yoho called me, and I quote, an effing B. She used the full phrase. She goes on to say, This is not new, and that is the problem. Mr. Yoho is not alone. He was walking shoulder to shoulder with Representative Roger Williams, and that's when we start to see that this issue is not about one incident. It is cultural. She goes on to explain, and then she ends with, This is a pattern of of an attitude towards women and dehumanization of others. And then she goes on to rip a a new one in the most eloquent way. She basically just says, In your quote-unquote apology, the fact that you have a wife and two daughters does not exonerate you and does not excuse your behavior. Men of power who are married to women and have daughters have throughout history always oppressed women and always called women bad names and always kept women down. So the fact that you have a wife and daughters has nothing to do with anything. Why did you even bring that up? (laughs) You know? Now, I just want to, again, say that you can agree with Congressman Yoho's policies, the way he votes, you know, the, when he votes on a bill, you could be like, yeah, that he's my representative or he's the type of representative that I want that would vote that way because that's their job. Their job is to legislate. So you can agree with him and also call him out for sexist behavior. Do we live in a country led by third graders or do we want to live in a country led by mature wise level-headed adults who understand how society works and understand the very basics of social psychology i.e sexism sexism is a simple concept people and it shouldn't be politicized it's just unfair to treat people unfairly it's obvious research has shown that there is that, that women experience more unfair treatment than men do because of their identity. Now, I always get comments, you know, some dude is like, ah, oh, no, there's research that show. Okay. Yes, you can cherry pick research that says that men can be targets of race, of sexism, and that white people can be targets of racism. Yes. I, as a half white person, have been a target of racism against me as a white person as a half white person. I've been a target of sexism because I'm male. As a man, I've been treated unfairly because I'm a dude. It happens. But it's a matter of frequency and intensity. Has Have I experienced racism and sexism at, at the frequency that uh, black and indigenous people experience in the United States, that women have experienced in the United States? No. Empirically, that is just not true. Now, there might be some black woman who, by some miracle, has experienced less oppression than I have. You know, there's a bell curve there. I can't imagine that being true, but, you know, uh, anecdotally. And I could imagine a, a white male heterosexual person experiencing a lot of mistreatment because of his identity. But on average, we have a problem. And it's clear in the empirical data. And yes, you can cherry pick some studies that demonstrate otherwise. But when you take it as a whole, which is literally thousands upon thousands of studies, it's clear. For example, you take a resume. This is just an eloquent way of testing this. You take a resume and it's the same. It's the same resume, but you change the name from a man's name to a woman's name. And guess what? The women get hired less often or they get asked to you know show up for an interview less often for just a regular non-gendered job you know just like an office job 
Same thing with uh, a quote-unquote black-sounding name and a quote-unquote white-sounding name. Black people don't get called for interviews as much as the white-sounding name does. It's clear. It's obvious. And there's so many other studies. I don't know why I'm arguing. I'm, I'm guessing if you're listening this far, you know this. It's I'm preaching to the choir, hopefully. I don't know. So, to summarize, yes, political correctness can be annoying, but when we look at certain words and certain words are used in a certain context, you know, like you can call your friend an effing B, right? And if your friend receives it as a joke, it's like, okay, what are you going to do? You're not going to be upset. You're saying, ah, that's funny. So it's not the words. It's the meaning of the word. It's the context. Now, we can't get into Yoho's mind, but given his quote-unquote apology, I think we know why he was using that, that uh, insult or that slur, racist, sexist slur. I think it's clear that, as I said, he was calling upon, or at least not afraid to call upon, eras of oppression and mistreatment and dehumanization of women as a way of telling her to shut up and to know her place and as a way of retaining power, as a way of avoiding the anxiety of having to reduce your own power. That's a big part of this. A big part of the convulsions that we're going through right now with Black Lives Matter is that people in power, they get real afraid of losing power. And I've been there as a man and as a mostly privileged half-white person. Among most identities, I am, I am at the top of the heap when it comes to privilege. The only thing that brings me down a peg is the fact that I'm not entirely white. But I've experienced that, that privilege fear. I've experienced that. I, I've, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. I've, I've, I've been through a lot of eras in our country. <laughs> and and I, was, I didn't come out of the womb enlightened. I certainly wasn't enlightened when I was a teenager. I, I mean, there were signs of enlightenment with regards to this, but it took me until I was probably, I don't know, 30 years old, maybe. I was already a therapist by that point before I really saw the matrix. So I've, I've felt that feeling. I've felt that fear. And, and I get it. It's not like these people are uh, purposely participating in an evil construction of power. They're not, in my opinion. Most, some people are. But most of these people, they're just afraid. They're scared of the unknown. They don't know, they don't know what to do. They have always known, consciously or unconsciously, that they have dodged a bullet by their identity. They've seen the slums and the poor people, and they've seen that those people look more brown. They've seen prisons, and they've seen that most of those people look brown. And they've seen people dying young of, of conditions that are related to poverty and, and racism and, and stress of a, of a society. And they've noticed most of those people are brown. And they sleep at night saying like, oh my God, I hope, I pray to God that I'm able to hold on to my privilege. They don't, they don't word it that way in their head. But, and then when you start to say, hey, you are going to have to share the power now because we're coming up. You're going to have to share. And your place in the world, your identity in the world is no longer uh, at the top. And here we come. This is happening. And, you know, when I was young, the United States uh, race-wise race, race wise was, I don't know, something like 70% white or something, I can't remember, but it was, it was a vast majority white people. Well, at some point in the last 20 years or something, it transitioned to white people actually being less than 50% of the United States. I can't remember where it is now, but I remember that being you know, heavily reported. And you would think white people would be like, well, we're still the dominant force in our society because it's not like the other half are united. I mean, we're talking about the other half are black people, African, you know, African-American people, Asian-American people, Hispanic people. You know, they're not one group. It's not. It's not one group. We're still the dominant uh, identity of Caucasian Americans, and even then, you could argue they're not a dominant, or they're not all the same. But anyway, the point is, is that 
they experienced a lot of anxiety. I remember that's when white supremacy started to become more mainstream. I don't, as a kid, I don't remember people talking about race the way that they do now. I don't remember white people being so upset about civil rights. I mean, they were for sure, but I just don't remember it being so mainstream, really. And now it's it's mainstream. Why? I think because uh, they're afraid. And so men are also afraid. They're afraid they're going to lose power and and they equate their power with their safety. They equate their privilege with their ability to get their needs met. It's a very human basic thing. And so how do we help them understand that we can all get our needs met? In fact, when women are not dehumanized, <laughs> when people of color are not oppressed and thrown in internment in camps just because of the color of their skin, we all win, all of us. It, it's not a zero sum game. It, we all get to win. At the very least, you don't have to listen to us complain to you anymore. <laughs> if we all have power, we'll stop complaining. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm ranting, but the, yeah, this effing B comment and what it represents and AOC's response is another step in the direction. So if it's one thing that or if it, there's two things to pull away from this. One is that when we use these words, think about the history and the sociocultural meaning, uh, the, the social construction of that term. For me, ugly American doesn't hurt me. Dirty Jap rocks me to my core. Someone calls me a gringo on the street. I'm like, okay, I'm a gringo. I mean, when I was in uh, Colombia, I, I, people called me gringo to my face, <laughs> Cuba as well. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm a gringo. Someone calls me a dirty Jap, or better yet, someone calls my dad a dirty Jap in public. We're going to have, uh, I don't even know what's going to happen. In fact, I have thought this through, at you know, when my grandmother was alive, my Japanese grandma I, I wondered what I would do if someone called her a name in front of my face. I, and I'm pretty sure it would have come to blows. Put me in jail. I don't care. You call my grandma, you call my dad a dirty Jap, like, um, we're going to have words. And I'm a pacifist. <laughs> I don't believe in violence. What does it prove? But you do that to me or my people, like, stuff's going to happen. And... That's what AOC heard when she heard effing B from a man of privilege calling her an effing B. That's what she heard. She heard all those generations of oppression. It wasn't just calling her a simple name. It was a lifetime of being called that name in, in particular circumstances. And for you women out there, you know what I'm talking about, or I'm guessing most of you women. If you come from a different society, I'm guessing there's a different word that might, uh, or a set of different slurs, you know, sexist slurs that might apply to you. You know, most of us understand that the N word towards black people is uh, not okay. And, you know, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not we should say they're not okay to use and maybe we should use them under some circumstances when we're trying to call out you know it's a whole debate i don't i don't know how to what to say about that but you you know what i'm saying and we have gotten to a point now where the majority of americans at least anecdotally i'm guessing research would find this understand that using the n-word is not okay but using effing b is fine right because we haven't had the awareness about sexism the way that we have awareness about racism. We have a long way to go regarding our, uh, our awareness of racism, but I believe we have an even longer way to go regarding our awareness of sexism. We've come a long way, <laughs> in my lifetime even, but boy do we have a long way to go in all fronts. And so we need to fight back 
If you are a voter in Yoho's district, if you agree with his policies and you like the way he legislates, then, you know, write him an email and say, hey, I, I like the way you legislate. I don't like the way you apologize. I don't like, like the, the language you used with AOC, and I, I don't like the way you apologized. That's my point here is it doesn't have to be politicized. Just be, you know, if you're a Republican listening right now, you don't have to stick up for this Republican uh, person just because they're Republican. And along those lines, by all means, if this was a, a liberal that had said this, I, I would I would have the same words. This has, to me, nothing to do with partisan politics. This has to do with right and wrong. I mean, I always say, and there's a poster that, a famous poster that I would see in the 90s. Everything, uh, what was it like? Everything I needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten. It's a good It's a good thing to think about because I feel like in our weird uh, world today, people haven't, they, they've forgotten the lessons that our kindergarten teacher taught us that are just so obvious. You don't call people names. It's that simple. And when you do, you apologize. You can disagree. You can't call people names, especially when they're associated with so much hate. You can't do that. That's not okay. It's, it's impolite. It's immoral. It's immature. It's what, it's what children do and teachers and parents chastise them for. You don't do that. You can disagree. You can vote the way you want to vote. You don't call people names. You can point out how the other legislature is incompetent at their job. <laughs> you could say, you know what, AOC, the way she votes, she doesn't know what she's doing. Look what she did here. She voted for this. She voted for that. I don't agree with her. I think that's a bad policy because of this reason. That's fine. That's what you should be doing. You're a politician. Calling someone names? Let's, let's understand that that's not okay for anybody. And I'm guilty too. I've called people names and that's not okay. And if I've ever hurt anyone on this podcast that's listening right now, if you've been a target of me calling you a name, I apologize. And I've done that before. I'm trying to remember when that's happened. Uh, well, one time I actually used the phrase effing white people. And I remember someone... Uh, was hurt by that and emailed me and I apologized. I didn't remember saying it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's not okay. Well, that's name calling. Why would you do that? I've done it before and you apologize. That's the mature thing to do. That's what my kindergarten teacher taught me. I shouldn't have to remind people of that. So let's be clear. Sexism is alive and well, and we can all do things to mitigate it, to change society. It doesn't take much. It just takes an open mind. It takes listening. It takes reading the actual science and respecting science and remembering what your kindergarten teacher taught you. All right. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. 